and installing some fencing in your backyard. Suddenly, your neighbor shows up and claims that you installed the fence six inches too far into his property. Without warning, he tosses a glove at your feet and brandishes a mace, challenging you to a trial by combat. Sound extreme? Yes, because it is! Well, for centuries, this was just the way most land disputes were settled across Europe. No, 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 no! Ugh, it's okay, I'm fine, we're fine, we're fine, we're just... <sighs> part two, here we go. So this is part two out of what I expect to be a three-part series of Trial by Combat. Mainly what we're going to be talking about today is the difference between criminal and civil trial by combat in the Middle Ages. But before we get to that, I want to very briefly recap part one as well as correct a mistake that I made in part one. So part one discussed criminal trial by combat, specifically criminal trial by combat in England after 1066. First, trial by combat could only be made in cases where an appeal is brought. That is, a criminal action where it was one person suing another person for a criminal action. In 1166, once we get the system for indictment, that becomes the normal mode of making a criminal accusation. That is, 12 people are now bringing a person before a court rather than one person. But this doesn't get rid of the appeal entirely. The appeal still sticks around, though it becomes much less of the norm. Ultimately, though, it was up to the judge whether or not to declare trial by combat. If the judge thought you were guilty, then you were probably going to be guilty. It was only reserved for those very, very specific gray area cases. Now, a mistake that I made in part one was to say that we had nothing in the written code prior to 1066, and that's why we're only looking at 1066. I actually misinterpreted one of my secondary sources. So to correct that, we don't have anything in sort of a written code regarding trial by combat in England prior to 1066, but we do have it for some other Germanic countries. And of course, like I've been saying, we know that trial by combat absolutely existed prior to 1066. It's just that from 1066 onward, we have the proper sources to sort of weigh out what it actually looked like. So it's possible that even in England, trial by combat existed before 1066. We just don't know a whole lot about it. So now let's talk about the differences between criminal and civil trial by combat. <laughs> Now, in order to discuss the differences between criminal and civil trial by combat, we first have to have a basic understanding of what the differences between a criminal and civil action are. The main difference is who is actually bringing the suit against a certain person. Criminal cases are the result of a person committing a crime, and they are being prosecuted by the state or by the government. So a criminal suit is one in which it is the government against a person. A civil suit, on the other hand, is typically a person against a person. Criminal suits, again, involve commissions of crime, so they would be cases for things like murder, thievery, burglary. Someone has done something that is against the law of the land, and now the state is prosecuting that person. Civil suits, on the other hand, would be suits for things like contract disputes, property disputes, and things of that nature. Even as far back as the Middle Ages, the judicial system distinguished between criminal and civil actions. Now, what we've already discussed is the process of bringing an appeal, which is a criminal procedure. Now we're moving on to the civil case, which involves bringing not an appeal, but a writ. <laughs> The writ system is extremely complicated, so I'm going to try to explain it as simply as I can, but know that some nuance is going to be lost here. Basically, a writ is a formal administrative order issued under the authority of the king by a court or a judge. The writ is Anglo-Saxon in origin, so we're only talking about England here. Now more than ever, we are departing from how the rest of the continent operated. Now, there were hundreds of writs, and we cannot possibly talk about all of them. But really, the only one that we need to talk about is the writ of right. And that's because the writ of right was really one of the only ones where trial by combat was instituted. It is a writ issued for cases of land disputes, and it declares who is the rightful owner of a piece of land. Say you are the rightful owner of a piece of land that someone else is claiming. You go before the judge or the court of chancery and you purchase for yourself a writ of right that says that this is in fact your land and you have the right to be on it. And that writ operates almost exactly like an order from the king. This initial system was slightly problematic because if the person who you just kicked off of your land and said, hey, that land is mine, if it was actually theirs, their only recourse is to go before the judge and obtain a writ of right for themselves. Then both of those writs would have to be resubmitted back to the court of chancery for them to figure out who has the superior right. This was a very expensive and time-consuming process and eventually it evolved. During the reign of Henry the second, writs essentially become like stock arguments or stock briefs that you could submit before the court. So if there's a dispute of ownership regarding land, you would purchase a writ of right from the court of chancery and then submit that writ to the court for them to figure out who actually owns the land. 
So you purchase the writ of right, bring the writ of right to the court, and then bring your opposing party to the court for the court to figure out who owns the land. Now, another thing that's worth mentioning is for the writ of right, we're talking about ownership, not merely possession or occupancy. If you were complaining about somebody else occupying your land, that might be something like the writ of trespass. So what exactly do we mean by a dispute of ownership? One common case is a case like we saw in the very beginning, a boundary dispute. You discovered that your neighbor built a fence six inches too far over into your land. And so now there's a dispute as to who is the rightful owner of this six inch sliver of land. We will get to why that video was problematic though, just bear with me. Another common situation is when you have two warring nobles promising their followers tracts of land. For example, Empress Matilda, daughter of Henry I and mother of Henry II, fought in a civil war against King Stephen, Henry II's uncle. During that war, Empress Matilda promised certain tracts of land to her followers, while King Stephen promised those same tracts of land to his followers. Ultimately, though, there wasn't a clear victor to the war. A peace was decided upon by both parties. Stephen would reign for the remainder of his lifetime, after which Henry II, Empress Matilda's son, would ascend to the throne. So now we've got a real problem. If nobody really won, then who actually owns the land? So one of the parties would purchase a writ of right and bring it and the opposing party before the court to figure this out, with the end result being that the court would decide who is the rightful owner under the authority of the king. And now, without further ado, we finally get into the role that trial by combat played into this system. <laughs> Trial by combat was one of the methods reserved for resolving the writ of right. But there was one huge distinguishing feature that set it apart from criminal trial by combat, and that was the use of champions. In criminal trial by combat, champions could really only ever be used if you were a woman, if you were a child, or if you were old and disabled. In civil trial by combat, on the other hand, anybody could use a champion. And as time went on, it actually became a legal requirement to use a champion. Around the 12th or 13th century, you were no longer allowed to fight in your own trial by combat. Now, according to them, this was because if one of the claimants died in a trial by combat, then it actually wasn't decided in favor of the victor because one of the claimants was now dead, it was actually an undecided case. But in truth, this probably wasn't the real reason. It was probably just a legal fiction, with the real reason being that they didn't want people going to combat and possibly killing each other over land disputes. Which brings me perfectly right into the next point. Unlike criminal trial by combat, Civil trial by combat was not fought to the death. This is what always makes me go nuts. Whenever I see a video of someone talking about trial by combat, they usually fail to make this distinction that between civil and criminal trial by combat, one is to the death, one is not. A trial by combat in a criminal case was typically fought unarmored. Now the level of weapons and armor that you were allowed to have varied by country to country, but it was almost always unarmored. Whereas a civil trial by combat was fully armored head to toe. Now even in armor there is still a risk that you could die. But they were not fighting to the death, they were fighting till one of the champions or one of the parties gave up. Imagine it this way, it was almost like sports gambling. You'd have two people each represented by a champion and the champions would fight. As they're fighting, it starts to look bad for one of the champions. That person, seeing it look bad for his champion, decides to go to the opposing party and negotiate a settlement. And that is one of the biggest major distinctions that nobody ever talks about. So now let's go full circle and talk about that video at the beginning. Your neighbor says you've installed your fence six inches too far over. He does not just throw a glove at you and brandish a mace. First, you have to go to the court of chancery and buy a writ of right. Then you actually have to summon the other person to court. Then once the case is before the judge, you can ask for a trial by combat. And again, hope and pray that he doesn't just say lol no because he could rule on it right then and there. And also hope and pray that your opposing party doesn't just say haha no we're gonna take this to the jury because they absolutely had the right to do that if they were of the same or greater legal standing. But even if he does allow you to go to trial by combat, you still don't get to fight the other person. Because now both of you have to go out and and hire champions to fight in your stead. It's not a fight to the death, and there's always a chance that your champion could give up losing you the case. Also, if this is in England, you would not throw gloves or even throw down a glove. You would exchange gloves with the other person. Like, both of you would give each other your glove. You know what? We'll, we'll get to that in part three. There is still a lot to be covered in terms of the minutia of the pre-fight and the fighting procedures, but we're going to save that for part three, and now that we have a baseline knowledge of how the process works, we're also going to start to throw in some regional variation. But that is it for part two. Thank you guys so much for watching. I hope that you guys are enjoying this series. I hope you enjoy part three when it comes out. I don't know how many of you guys found me through TikTok versus how many of you found me exclusively through YouTube, but for both groups, actually, I just dropped a merch store if you care about supporting the channel and want some funny gear. The reason I make the TikTok YouTube distinction is because most of the stuff actually has to do with jokes that I make on my TikTok. But if you feel like supporting the channel over there or over here, I'm linking the store in the description below, or you could, as always, just keep watching the vids. And I will see all of y'all in part three.